All right. So yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Jason Crawford, and uh, I am your host for the Torch of Progress. This is the speaker series for our um, uh, course, uh, online course, Progress Studies for Young Scholars. Progress Studies for Young Scholars is an online learning program in the history of technology uh, aimed at the high school level. Uh, we ran it initially over the summer as a summer program, now being offered um, as an after-school program, an online program through uh, the high school, the Academy of Thought and Industry. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, you can go to progressstudies.school. Um, I uh, am your host, Jason Crawford. I write The Roots of Progress, which you can find at rootsofprogress.org. I write about the history of technology and the philosophy of progress. And uh, our guest today is Adam Wiggins. Uh, Adam was the uh, co-founder and uh, uh, CTO, you were CTO, is that right, of uh, Heroku? Um, for those outside the software industry, uh, Heroku is uh, a, a platform for hosting web applications. And it was uh, one of the first that came along and made that super easy. Um, I was a, uh, I've been a user of it for many years to host um, uh, my my last startup was all hosted on uh, Heroku, and uh, and and it's my preferred place to sort of host side projects and apps now. So um, they were really uh, pioneers in in what became known as platform as a service. Um, and now he runs an industrial research lab called Ink and Switch. And what he's going to do is uh, tell us about uh, some of the history that inspired that. So uh, I think that's with with that. I think we can go ahead and uh, take it away, Adam. Thanks, Jason. Uh, excited to be here and talk about this subject that's passionate, uh, something I'm passionate about uh, because it sort of inspired the creation and shaping of Ink and Switch, this independent research lab. Um, so let me, I got some slides going here. So I'm just going to do the screen share shuffle here if I can. If I can. And I'll just mention, by the way, that um, go ahead and uh, if you're a student in um, one of our classes, uh, go ahead and put your questions in the class Slack and um, we'll give priority to those. And uh, everybody else, go ahead and put any questions in the chat here. And um, after, uh, this will take about 30, 40 minutes and then we'll go into a, a question period. All right, I hope that's looking good. So this is a brief history of industrial research. I'm Adam Wiggins, as Jason said, and um, I'm going to tee things up by asking the question, uh, what do these things have in common? So that's the light bulb, the transistor, the internet, and GUI computer operating systems. Um, and the answer there for me, at least, in addition to being these transformative technologies, uh, is that they all came out of what I'm going to call industrial research. And I think that industrial research is a type of technology development or a way more of a method and an approach to technology development that I think is understudied and underappreciated. And I got really interested in the history of it while working on Ink and Switch. And that's uh, why I actually developed these slides. It was for a team offsite a few years back. So with that comes a disclaimer. I know in this forum, you've had some amazing scholars who are deep in their field. This is not my area of study. I'm an enthusiast. I looked into it for a little while because I was interested and eventually I put together this deck for our team to get us inspired. You can think of it as a form of corporate propaganda, if you like, uh, meaning that in a neutral sense that it's to inspire and excite and create context about the history and the theme we are fitting into um, rather than trying to establish uh, myself as a deep authority. So hopefully if you're enthusiastic about this stuff too, uh, then we can um, be curious about it together. So before I talk about those four inventions, I've got this kind of spectrum of innovation that um, I often now use as a mental framework. And you can see some examples here, such as electricity, kind of basic understanding, this basic force of the universe that later was put to work in some basic ways, such as the light bulb, and eventually was deployed widely through the power grid and all that sort of thing. And you can see a similar path for a lot of different stuff, like semiconductor materials to transistors to the microchip. Uh, industry and modern computers, similarly for the information information theory to packet switching and eventually the modern internet. Um, and I think when you think about the institutions that create or the mechanisms we have societally to create these, the far left, the discovery is 
academic world, universities, that kind of research. And I think of that as being, you know, science in its purest form. It's a search for the truth. It's search for truth. When people, I don't know, in the late 1800s were trying to understand the nature of electricity, it was just, what is this weird force that comes out of the sky as lightning or shows up as static electricity? They didn't necessarily know or expect that there would be any application to human life. They're just trying to understand how the world works. And I think that's the nature of science and just pursuing truth as its own, as its own end rather than because we believe there's an application. And then the other side of the spectrum, what I usually would just call innovation, is a world I'm very familiar with, which is startups. Um, there's probably other uh, places where that happens, but let's say commercial uh, innovation more generally. And there it's really taking a technology that's understood, say in the academic world, and bringing that to wider deployment. And so it's not to say it is very hard to operationalize it, but it's not necessarily about something truly new. In fact, very often startups are mobilizing technology that it may have been around for decades, but they're finding a way to bring it into products you can use in your daily life. And it's about you take money from investors, they want to see a return within a, a pretty short period of time, and you need to be able to sell a product to customers. And, and in fact, Time Horizons is a definitely a good way to um, understand this, which is academic research has many decades time horizon. The results of that may or may not be useful ever, but certainly could be over the course of many decades, where startups need to basically have a product that solves a problem for people and people are willing to pay for it in a matter of just a handful of years. So I think of industrial research as something that fills in this middle gap a little bit and, and in more of a, uh, less of a haphazard way, maybe in more of a structured way, which is looking at a five to 10 year time horizon, okay, how can we take some of the advances from the world of science and academia and um, bring that into something that could be useful to solve problems in people's lives in the real world, so to speak, uh, but not necessarily on this incredibly tight timeline. Should I stop for questions along the way or keep rolling forward? Um, I would say go ahead and yeah, keep rolling forward. Um... If people do have questions, go ahead, put them in the chat. And if there's something that I think, uh, you know, warrants a brief interruption, I'll, I'll call it out. Um, and otherwise, we'll just hold most of them to the end. Well, in that case, we'll dive into some examples. So I think of the proto-industrial research lab as, and I'm sure there's many examples around the world of, of uh, curious inventors, but one who looms large in maybe particularly the American uh, mythology is Thomas Edison. And he had a called a proto-industrial research lab called Menlo Park, located in, in uh, kind of New York State. This is circa the 1880s. The picture of Thomas Edison, consummate inventor, circa, I think towards the end of his life, this was 1918. And, you know, he's most famous for the light bulb, but he has a huge list of innovations to his name, including recorded sound. The phonograph was essentially his big breakthrough. Uh, the light bulb, yes, but also the power grid and AC power. There's a whole crazy drama there with, uh, Tesla and uh, Westinghouse that you can read about if you're you're interested, but essentially not just the light bulb itself, but the whole delivery mechanism for electricity on a large scale. Uh, he has this whole project with automated iron mining I'll talk about. And then uh, to my surprise, uh, he was also pretty involved in movies, projected movies. Um, so this is a guy that just spent his whole life thinking about how can we not only um, invent, but invent things that will have immediate and useful applications in the world. So for example, here's a stock ticker he did for Western Union in 1871. Here he is with his breakthrough, which is the phonograph. That was circa 1878, he was 31 here. And these, are the, these aren't uh, records, vinyl records, we would think of they're the wax cylinders where they etch that, etch that in. I did the light bulb in 1879. There's his patent application. But then it was really the deployment of electricity, like I said, that was the real triumph here. So this is an Edison dynamo at work. Um, the New York City overhead wiring, and there was pretty substantial social debate about this, in fact, that's, that's quite interesting. People were worried that, I don't know, people were going to get electrocuted and birds were going to be falling out of the sky and, you know, blackening the skyline and all that sort of thing. But getting a, getting a power grid deployed was just a massive, massive undertaking. Now, getting on to his uh, lab, so here's Menlo Park. And again, I kind of consider this a prototype. He called it his invention factory. So this was kind of in the suburbs of New York. Um, that's a drawing, I think, but this is, a, this is an actual photo. 
And there's a reproduction of it today in the Henry Ford Museum. So it kind of looks like that. Um, and then later after his success with electricity, he uh, made another facility or he opened a new facility called in West Orange, 60,000 square feet, huge building, uh, really just like an inventor's paradise. So he had a, a machine shop, electrical testing rooms, glass blowing, chemical department, photo, photo, photography department, and a pretty epic library here, 10,000 scientific volumes. So clearly this is a guy that doesn't, didn't get a success and just think now nah, I wanna relax. He, uh, and in fact, here's a couple quotes of his that, that I like. One, he talks about, I don't really care about rich toy, rich man's toys. I just want the workshop, right? And you can see that when he built. And then also an, an oft quoted thing that is, I, I obtained money to go on inventing. So it becomes the, what I usually call the flywheel of self-funding. And that flywheel is something that I think is um, an important piece of all industrial research labs once you get beyond this kind of individual. You need, need some way that your innovations fund the next set of things. So I mentioned the iron mining project. So after his big success with electricity, uh, his project that he went after was based on, I guess at the time there was a diminished yield from iron mines, uh, but there was a new technology and you see it uh, depicted in this image. So basically you've got um, the ability, it's almost like a fracking kind of thing where they basically crush up the rocks and then they drop it through the stream that you see there and they use an electromagnet to pull a stream of the, the iron ore out into a separate thing. So that was a sort of a different way versus the classic guys with pickaxes pulling stuff out. Um, and what was amazing about this, he, he, he thought, okay, if we build a new kind of um, mine, we can base or a new kind of, uh, I guess, refining facility. I'm not sure what you would call that exactly. Essentially, he can take advantage of this fact that the iron price is going to go up soon. And he built this thing that was really quite astonishing. It's a completely automated factory. Um, so that's obviously well before its time. It brings to mind the, you know, the Elon Musk, Tesla, Gigafactory kind of thing. Um, so here in the picture, you see a, a small human there in the bottom. They do the maintenance of the machine, but the whole process runs autonomously. And so he bit his, essentially his entire personal fortune, I calculated at about 50 million bucks in today's money, which again, call back to the kind of Elon Musk thing, putting your personal wealth at stake for a project you believe in. Um, and part of what I think is important about this and research in general is that the nature of research is if you're trying something hard, interesting, new, you're going to fail you should fail probably more often than you succeed to be, to be really honest. Um, and so to my point of view, this is impressive because he had a really good hypothesis about the rising iron prices and what would happen in terms of the price of automated factory going down and iron prices going up. Um, he put all this money into it. He, he made a really good, but it just didn't pan out that way. Basically there was some uh, new surface mine discoveries were made and iron prices didn't go up and they couldn't get the price of the factory down. Um, and I like this quote that he he said uh, at the end when they had to shut this whole thing down. Um, so, guy likes inventing. Uh, today, you can go to West Orange and uh, it's a, um, that facility is a national park. And there's even a, uh, a tower, a memorial tower on the original Menlo site park that we saw a sketch of earlier in there. That's Thomas Edison. So the second one I should want to show you is Bell Labs. So this, this actually spans a pretty long period of time, but I'll, I'll just peg it to the 1940s to kind of give us a, um, a vague sense. And this is while Edison is a single individual who managed to scale up his efforts, Bell Labs is almost the complete opposite. Uh, Bell was this just massive sprawling monopoly. I think it's probably the biggest monopoly in history. And um, they had this ambitious, a dream or mission to uh, connect the entire United States with um, telephone service. I think the, this is Theodore Vail. He was the kind of the, uh, the leader at the time. And he had the, the concept of a single system, a single network with universal service. The idea that someone could pick up a phone in New York and place a call to get through to someone in Ohio or some, or even further all the way to the West Coast was this crazy ambitious dream that they had. So here you can see this, this is what they called the system, which was essentially their network. Um, this was sort of what it was circa, let's see, this map is from yeah, the late, late 1800s. So they just had the kind of Eastern, Northeastern part of the United States connected. Um, and the result of being this massive monopoly, this massive cash cow is that on one hand, they had this incredible technical needs in terms of the system and feeding the needs of the system. On the other hand, they also had, were throwing off massive amounts of cash. 
Um, and there were even some things there around the, the, the antitrust, obviously, Bell eventually got broken up. But the idea of making, they essentially put all of those things together and made Bell Labs for the purpose of um, trying to pursue innovations that would serve uh, the company's purpose. And I'd say they were pretty successful. Here's a short list of, of things they invented. Um, yeah, so I, in many ways, this is the most successful research lab of all time. Now, of course, it was also connected to one of the biggest cash cows of all time. And this, these, these inventions span many, many years. Uh, but the transistor is one that I'll, I'll drill in on here a little bit, which is they weren't invented to create computers. That wasn't the goal. These are vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes were the uh, main ones. I think it's this, the second from the left is the one that would have been used in the 1930s. Um, and essentially, they said, okay, we have these vacuum tubes. They're critical for the communications network, but they burn out all the time. They're expensive. They have to be replaced. Is there a solid state replacement for that? So it turns out they were able to, uh, in the labs, create uh, the transistor. This is the very first transistor, and there's a kind of a modern replica of it right there. So this 1947. Here's the, the three fellows that, that made what they called the crystal triode in the beginning. Um, there's also a whole a drama there about who, who sort of took credit for that um, that we won't get into. But all, all, of these, all of these pieces of history usually have their own little, little soap operas behind them. So yeah, Bell made it as a vacuum tube replacement. They needed it for their switching network for their growing uh, network. But they, in the meantime, they decided to license it out to other companies and pretty quickly figure, people figured out you could build computers with it, which turns out to be actually a far more lucrative use. And again, this connects to the antitrust um, stuff a little bit, which is they could point to this, well, look, we're, we're creating these, these public goods in the service of um, you know, the, the whole nation. We're licensing things out cheaply or, and um, you know, it's, it's sort of juicing the whole economy was sort of the, the argument here. Also from Bell Labs, Claude Shannon, who made, um, this is the original version of the, the paper. Uh, notably at the time, it was called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. Later, it was renamed to The Math Mathematical Theory of Communication. But essentially, this is the guy that came up with the modern, the mathematical foundation for digital capabilities. So for example, he coined the word bit. Um, and uh, here's a, probably his most famous picture of him with his uh, machine learning mouse. He built a mechanical learning computer in, uh, I don't know, remember what the, this was, the 50s or something like that. Um, but this is a great example of the sort of thing that comes out. I, I put this actually more in the basic science category, but you know, it, it enabled so much. Um, so yeah, bit was one of the ideas that came out of this uh, paper, it's short for binary digit. And be this ability to reason about information mathematically and think about signal versus noise, things like bandwidth, error correction, check digits, checksums, all that comes from here. And again, this was Bell was the perfect feeder for this because they had this huge, challenging problem trying to connect um, the whole uh, the whole nation with this communications network. Um, so having these breakthroughs like transistors and information theory coming out of um, coming out of that points to one of the patterns that we'll we'll kind of talk about at the end. So the third one I'll talk about, again, also cut from a different cloth here because it's a government, um, more of a grant, uh, grant offering agencies, but that's ARPA. So this is circa 1960s. Now, in 1957, Russia put a satellite, or the USSR put a satellite in orbit, that's Sputnik. Here's a commemoratory uh, stamp. And uh, to say Americans freaked out would be, the, um, would be an understatement. So there was this panic that the Russians were ahead on science and technology. They were gonna put all these satellites into orbit. They were gonna control the earth. Um, and I think it was still fresh in people's minds. This was, you know, 20 some odd years later after World War II, where technology was so decisive. Things like the atom bomb and cryptography were the things that decided the war. And so with the Cold War heating up, and now you see the space race is in full, uh, is in full swing here. And Eisenhower, who was the president of the United States at the time, um, he was actually pretty, you could imagine a world where there was a president or an administration that was very militaristic about this. But happily, we had one who was very sympathetic to science, to intellectual solutions versus kind of the military approach. And he used what they called the Sputnik crisis to initiate ARPA. So ARPA was a, an institution to essentially hand out 
grants to things that would advance science technology, particularly related to potentially things that would have military application. And so, again, you look at the list of stuff that has sort of come out of this, it's, it's huge packet switching and TCI, TCP IP, email, RFCs, uh, essentially interactive computing, that is to say doing teletypes versus, versus punch machines, interactive adventure games, wireless networking. Um, and this is a little bit harder to trace because actually, again, ARPA is this grant distributing machine. And so these uh, places like RAND and BBN and SRI uh, were the places that did the actual research. But ARPA was here sort of giving out these grants um, in a way that, and, and, and that continues to this day, although has, has changed somewhat. Um, but this really accelerated a lot of stuff, particularly in the computing space. And one of my favorites example of this was there was a pressing military need or, or at least perceived that we needed a network that was not just fully connected the way that um, say you know, the Bell Connect network was, but was actually something that could, you could have a nuclear strike on one major city. You could just take say New York off the map and still be able to control missile computers. This was kind of the, the thinking. And packet switching is this very different way to do networking rather than these continuous connections. It's based on these um, reroutable packets. Um, and that, of course, is the basis of the internet. Um, here's a, 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 a thing that shows the kind of growth of the internet in the early and mid 70s. Um, but yeah, the other piece of this that had an interesting flywheel effect and interesting serendipity is on one hand, we're creating this packet switching because we want this network to you know, control missile silos or whatever. But once these computers are online and they're connected to each other, that creates this, there's this common pool of money and talent through ARPA. And then you've got the network computers and people are connecting in this way. And it created a sort of distributed lab, I would say. Um, at least everything I read about that time seems like it was a pretty, pretty special time to be part of the research community there. Yeah, and a pretty, the packets, the transferring of individual kind of data packets, that turned into file transfers. And file transfers turned in, was pretty natural, or email rather was pretty natural once you had file trans transfers, because you could say, huh, I can transfer a file to someone. How about if I just stick kind of like some headers at the top that say when I send it, what the subject is and who it's for, and copy it to their computer. Um, so this is kind of one of the early, um, uh, early examples of what email looked like. I also like this, if you're in the technical world, you know that RFCs, that's request for comment, is a structured way to uh, basically explore the, uh, the potential for a, a standard, a data standard or an interchange standard. And I think it reflected the culture of the time. Weirdly, even though you had all this um, funding that was essentially, well, certainly government, but in many ways kind of military aims in mind, you had a sort of decentralized thing with this network of computers that was coming up, almost an anti-authority um, kind of vibe to it. And in fact, the RFC one, which we're looking at here in 1969, describes a handshake between two computers, actually has one of the first ASCII art diagrams, I think that was, uh, that was created. So yeah, so here we see, you know, a way to send some packets back and forth between a couple of computers to kind of establish a, a connection. I like this quote here where people were talking about the protocol is a word we use in technology all the time now to talk about communications protocols. And um, someone said, uh, huh, protocol, what does that mean? Like that makes you think of diplomacy or something, something like that. Um, but again, it reflects that culture, I think, which was protocol between diplomats is something where you have two kind of, um, what's the word for it, sort of autonomous agents negotiating to find common ground. So it reflects that kind of decentralized, not kind of top-down um, top culture. So there's way more to talk about in terms of what ARPA did and, and how they run and that sort of that sort of thing. But we'll move on to the final example here. So Xerox Park has a, I would say, a basically a mythical status among uh, many folks, particularly those that work on um, more forward-thinking um, sort of gesture systems and rethinking the OS and that sort of thing. So where this came from, and again, you'll see a pattern here that calls back to Bell Labs, is you had the Xerox Corporation in the 1960s, and they had this incredible cash cow, which was a copier, right? It was even synonymous. Xerox meant a machine that makes copies of paper. Um, and it was, it was an incredible cash cow, and they were doing very well, but they also recognized they were a one-trick pony. And they recognized that if something happened that came along and something changed with office technology, that their 
would be pretty knock, quickly knocked out of um, relevance, which was, which was quite smart of them. So while they were still producing this cash, they established a research center in Palo Alto, California. And the theme was the office of the future. They basically charged the people that uh, were going to work there with this task of, okay, if we had a time machine and you go 10 years in the future and see what's in people's offices, what would it look like? Okay, let's build that. And it was incredibly successful. Um, and many, many things came out of it. Laser printers was the biggest one that, um, that I think Xerox was able to uh, commercialize. But you also had something like what you see is what you get, word processing, ethernet, uh, small talk was sort of the, the, the beginning of object-oriented programming. Postscript, which was kind of the modern predecessor to PDF. Uh, cut and paste concept. Video editing came out of here, although notably there. We'll talk about that one in a minute. Um, many others that I haven't even put on the list. So really an incredible, and compared to Bell Labs, actually, which, you know, the innovations I listed was over many decades. This was a pretty short period of time that this all came out. So probably a pretty special place to be. They also had this culture that was pretty well known for being quite different from the Xerox corporate, corporate culture, these kind of ragtag mavericks, uh, this kind of California hippie misfit thing. They even had this uh, profile in Rolling Stone you see right here uh, that actually really annoyed the management, but it was, it was, it was their style. The bean bags and the long hair and the people in their sandals at work and all that sort of thing. Probably the most um, kind of striking roll up of all this was the Alto. So this was essentially the world's first personal computer. It, a lot of different, uh, there's a lot, a, lot of, a lot of different machines have a claim to that, but I think there's a pretty good claim you can make here. And that included this GUI operating system with windows you can drag around, the mouse uh, connected to a network by ethernet, what you see is what you get, word processing, programming language that was very powerful, object-oriented, innovations like virtual memory, uh, so this was really like a modern, what we would think of as a 1990s era Windows computer or Mac basically existed in this form in, uh, I guess it was the, the early 70s. There's a screenshot of the operating system. Lots of great things you can say about Park, but a couple of quotes that I liked quite well. Um, or one, one I like quite well, which was really about the approach to research, which was using stuff, trying to make stuff that they could use. So the Alto, for example, is something that I think they made a hundred something and they distributed around the office and they were all using that as their daily work, uh, what nowadays we would call dog fooding maybe. Um, and so they would push themselves to not fully commercialize, not fully operationalize, but make a thing you could really truly use, not a one-off science project, something you publish a paper about and move on, which maybe is kind of the computer science uh, approach, but really something you could use over years and, and, and learn about it. Um, maybe as one famous uh, or one, one impressive example, uh, Alan Kay took the Alto and the Smalltalk programming language and he basically just went to a local uh, school and basically just taught a bunch of kids to program with object oriented programming language and a GUI computer. Uh, which is pretty amazing, using that to test out that, okay, do we think that actually, this actually is a more intuitive system? Other stuff from here, the ethernet, there was other kinds of networking, of course, but ethernet, which is kind of the foundation of modern um, local networking. This is the, the first diagram ever sketched. There's uh, David Boggs with an early ethernet card. They did try to commercialize the Alto as something called the Xerox Star. It was too expensive. It had some problems. There's, again, you know, there's, al there's always the soap opera. In this case, it was that Steve Jobs showed up one day, saw that they were doing, integrated that into the Macintosh. And in many ways, the Mac became the commercialization of uh, the Alto. I don't think that diminishes in any way the, uh, the accomplishments here, but um, that is a, what something many people think is, was a shame, at least for Xerox's sake. They also had lots of other weird stuff. There was this paint program called Super Paint, um, and they had the world's first digitized photo you're looking at right here. Um, and this was, this was another weird project where they just didn't know how to fit it in. It didn't really seem to connect to office stuff to them. Um, but actually, I think, I forget if it was this fellow or someone else, but some of the people that worked on that, they got frustrated and it eventually spun off and they, uh, uh, became part of industrial, or basically that begat industrial light magic, the special effect, movie special effects firm. So all kinds of um, 
major companies, technology, uh, major technology companies like 3Com, Industrial Light and Magic, Apple, um, that essentially were, were sort of fallout from the work they did here. And again, some people will point to these examples and say, well, why didn't Xerox commercialize these? Why wasn't Xerox doing the 3Com, you know, the Ethernet commercialization? Why wasn't Xerox? Um, but from my point of view, you know, the laser printer paid for all of this easily. And I like this quote here that basically says that you have to have the parent company of a corporate R&D lab exploit every idea the lab throws off. Um, because I think that, you know, if you're having a broad program, there's lots of exchange of ideas, you should be doing all this wild stuff. Only some of it is going to be suitable for commercialization by the, by the parent company. So I, I don't consider Parka um, in any way a, a failure by Xerox, even though maybe they did miss some, some good opportunities there. Well, looking across all four of these for some patterns, and again, this is because ultimately I wanted to find inspiration and find what works for Ink and Switch and maybe something we wanna see more of generally in the world. One I think is really important is a, a driving and immediate need, right? Edison looked at the pending iron ore shortage, the labs had the, the ongoing needs of the system, such as vacuum tubes being too fragile. ARPA had this thing about a nuclear strike that maybe or may, May, may or may not have been realistic, but all of these things get this incredible focusing thing. Because one challenge with research, more academic research is often that it's, I don't wanna say unfocused, but without some of the, the pressure or the intensity of a driving need, um, maybe it's a little more wandering, which again, I think is right for, for basic research where you just wanna see where truth takes you. Um, but if you wanna produce something that has more application value, I think you need ideally a source of ongoing driving need, right? Bell was great that way. You need vast scope, um, you need, and you need that five to 10 year time horizon. So something like Bell Labs or universal connectivity, that's just really ambitious idea for the time, or ARPA, this idea of networking all the world's computers, this kind of sub project that came out of that park, the office of the future. Um, so I think you need, it's gotta be, I think in a commercial entity or a startup or whatever, you actually need a lot more focus in that. We're solving this particular problem for this um, demographic of people, but I think something broader like Office of the Future or Universal Connectivity is necessary. You need a theme. It can't just be make good stuff, um, but you need that scope and you need that theme and then you need that decade time horizon. Another pattern is money. So I think being well-funded and not just as a one-off, but on an ongoing basis. You obviously had Edison self-funding Flywheel, Bell Labs, World's Biggest Monopoly, pretty good. Um, the, U the government Cold War, <laughs> the U.S. government engaged in the world superpowers Cold War, um, military tapping military budget, and in the case of Park, the cash cow from the copier. Um, and I think that funding helps uh, helps you think long term. You don't need to be thinking about where you're going to get that next grant next year or what have you. Um, but it also has to feed back into the purpose. So this is the flywheel. It can't just be well, we've got enough money to last us for ten years, so now we can go think big thoughts. You actually need to do the research, which gets the results, however those are defined, and those results get you more funding. And the academic model does work that way a little bit with grants and paper citations and that sort of thing. But I think there's, for more applied stuff, or at least looking at the patterns here, something where when Bell Labs is doing things that benefits the system, of course, they're gonna wanna put money into it. And, and in other cases where I've seen corporate R&D labs, for example, who have failed or, or been shut down, it's often the lack of that that flywheel. There's also the, let's call it the trade-off between openness versus commercializing your, secret, uh, your secrets. So you might have something like Park that many people lamented was too secretive and had they shared more and um, maybe that would have created, I don't know, would have gotten these ideas out more and maybe motivated Xerox to commercialize, I don't know. Um, ARPA is fully open. Uh, Bell Labs seems to have struck a good balance, maybe not on purpose, but it sort of happened. But you, you know, you can't and shouldn't commercialize everything. Some scope stuff will be out of scope for you, like Super Paint at Park. Um, but it should pay for itself long term by commercializing your key items. And so, of course, that openness and free exchange of ideas is how you recruit the best talent. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, there's an important trade off to to consider there. 
the facility is important. You know, all of these are very, very based on, uh, or the, the first three were very based on physical location and running into each other in the hallways and exchanging of ideas over brown bag lunches and people working in different disciplines. Um, ARPA was more uh, distributed and effectively built the first internet culture, right? RFCs, trading things over email, people in New York talking to people in uh, Los Angeles and feeling like they're part of the same community and they're part of colleagues. So I think you, you do need a place to gather, but it doesn't have to be a, a physical place. Culture-wise, you see this freewheeling kind of maverick, maverick thing. I think is is pretty commonplace. You, you need the big thinkers, right? Like the 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 more someone is kind of invested in the status quo, the less probably they're going to be the right kind of mad scientists for your group. And lastly, there's an ego story here. I didn't didn't touch on this too much, but this comes back to the to, to again the soap operas you can find everywhere, which is Edison made a kind of like some bad calls on DC versus AC. There's a whole thing where he lost control of his his uh, company. He was quite litigious in the movie industry. Um, yeah, Bell Labs had this crazy thing with the story with the transistor uh, thing. Uh, Park actually had um, they missed the whole Apple story because they saw homebrew computers like the Apple one and the other things that were part of that is, is just toys. Like, no, what we're doing is big, important things and amateur, you know, the idea of computers at home, like ironically, they were eventually event. They were basically inventing the world's first personal computer, but at the same time, they were sort of dismissing what we would now today consider a personal computer. Yeah, so I think there's a lot to learn from there. We're, we're trying to integrate uh, this stuff into kind of how we do Ink and Switch, but part of the reason why I like to share it, including with this group, is I'd like to see more groups that work this way, that whether it's groups that are under academic environments like universities, whether it's um, corporate R&D labs or truly independent uh, research, I think is something that I think the world could use more of. Um, that's my presentation. And uh, you can read about Ink and Switch on our website. We have our papers published there. And then there's me. I call me a student, amateur student of progress. And you can uh, read about me online as well. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Adam. That was, that was great. Um, so everybody, we're going to go ahead and uh, take some questions now. So go ahead and put them in the Slack if you're in one of our programs or um, in just in the chat here in Zoom, and then I'll kind of moderate and, and read off questions. Um, I'm just going to start us off, take moderator's privilege. Um, so Adam, in general, there's uh, a kind of view or maybe even a consensus that uh, the, the heyday of great corporate research labs is in the past and that we don't have things like this anymore. Um, yeah, Edison's lab and Bell Labs and all those things. And there were others um, in the... 20s and 30s, you know, you had like DuPont, Dow, the chemical companies, you had Eastman Kodak was doing fundamental research in like optics and, uh, you know, in chemistry. Um, and like Nobel Prizes went to people from these labs, right? And it was really, it was really quite impressive. And uh, I don't know, there's a general consensus that it seems like there's, we've sort of seen a decline of corporate research that, that there's not as much of it going on. Um, like, what do you think about that? Do you, do, do you have thoughts? Do you think it's true? Uh, would you counter that narrative? Do you, do you have thoughts on why it might have happened? How, how has this all sort of transformed? I would counter the narrative that um, great industrial research is in the past. I think it's easy to, of course, here I've cherry picked three or four astonishing examples from a hundred year period. Um, this is always the case, right? Yeah, you look back on music or art or anything else, and if you are choosing from a large period and you're choosing the success stories there, you have a very big pool. Um, at the same time, I have this intuitive sense that relative to the money and interest in technology innovation centering around Silicon Valley, to a lesser degree, maybe also healthcare innovation and so on, we don't have enough of these. This is a, And this is why it's something I'm passionate about is I'd like to see this model and or variations of this model uh, be more common. So some examples of modern research labs um, connected, for example, to, to uh, there's connected to academic institutions. That would be something like MIT Media Lab. Uh, there's uh, in the Silicon Valley, you've got Google X. So that gave us effectively gave us self-driving cars. Um, you've got something like um, YC did one called Hark that I think was ultimately uh, didn't didn't pan out. Um, 
and uh, Dolby is often listed as one that has kind of a research lab, corporate research lab culture. That said, I've struggled to find good um, accounts of these labs because in many cases they're the, cont the contemporary ones maybe are more private or maybe they haven't published well, or they haven't, um, you know, they may be publishing papers in the way I often find them. I don't know, even something like Microsoft Research, which in many ways is one of the best marketed, let's say, and whether or not they're successful or not is, um, you know, jury's, jury's still out on that, let's say, but, but they've done an incredible amount of research in, for example, the tablet and stylet space, space, which is where, kind of where I'm working now. And I tend to find this stuff by, you find papers and you look at the, the people who wrote them and you see that someone works for X and Y research lab. Samsung has a big research lab. Microsoft has a big one. I go, Oh, what's this? And you dig into it and you find it. Um, but I feel like these are not public in the way that say startups are with their kind of uh, outward facing brand. So I don't know how much there's really great labs going on and they're just kind of quiet versus, um, you know, there aren't as many as it seems like there could be. Uh, but yeah, I definitely have the feeling that there could be more with the money and interest in technology that exists today. Yeah. Do you think that corporate research labs today have um, as much of a, as much patience, like as much of a real long-term um, kind of horizon and willingness to, you know, wait for results? Yeah, that I don't have good information on, but... I don't know. I feel that the kind of <laughs> Silicon Valley likes to use the term moonshot. And I think that's troublesome in some ways, but um, the idea that you should do big stuff and have a bold vision and try to do something surprising and far reaching that can have a big impact for humanity is, is certainly part of the zeitgeist. Um, but whether that translates into action on these, on these labs, is yeah when you look at something like google x for example so much of that came from the founders i'm not sure what willpower or mojo something like that when they go in and they give them this directive and help them stick to that directive for a long time another good example there actually would be the um the amazon research lab the name is escaping me at the moment that they came up with the kindle and the fire phone and yeah, it's like lab Alexa. 126 yeah I that's think. that's the one exactly yeah, yeah. which i think they actually um, and yeah, that, acquired as i recall but yeah yeah, interesting. I didn't know that part, but it, at least as I understand it from some, some folks that work there, um, you know, very much you had Jeff Bezos has his eye on the long term. He has this incredible authority, both moral and actual as a founder um, and as, as the leader of the company and the willingness to say, look, it's okay to go and do a massive public failure like the fire phone because we're just going to keep going and try other stuff and then we'll have a huge success like Alexa. Um, yeah. So, so maybe you, you need that courage and that long-term vision to come from those really kind of cult of personality leaders. I would like to see us get more systematic in a way that people can, or we could, we could form uh, research institutions that could do this kind of work that doesn't depend on the singular leadership of Larry and Sergey or Jeff Bezos or whatever. Yeah, and it's interesting that I, I don't recall those sorts of, um, you know, charismatic, visionary founders as being so crucial in the past, right? Like, it's not like there was one visionary founder of AT&T and he was the one who created the lab and, you know, it was only because of him and so forth, right? So, um, I don't know. It makes me wonder, you know, there's it, like a, a thread that intersects with this is there's a general idea out there. And again, I don't even know 100% how much I believe this, but there's a general idea out there that corporations have become more short term. Right. You hear this all the time that, oh, Wall Street only cares about quarter to quarter earnings. Um, in fact, we've had just recently launched a whole, um, you may have heard of Eric Reese's long term stock exchange, which is literally a whole public, you know, exchange uh, for equities that is supposed to like be a platform to try to fix this short termism, um, which is a really interesting one to watch, in my opinion. So um, I don't know. I wonder sometimes whether some of these things factor in. But I haven't put the whole picture together myself, I would say. Um, uh, sorry to butt in, but I think we have a number of questions in the chat as well. Yeah, I, exactly. I was just uh, going to go to those next. Oh, so um, yeah, let's, uh, let's go. So, um, uh, so Michael asks, how is Ink and Switch different from uh, Stanford Research Institute and other contemporary examples of industrial research labs? Uh, and would you consider intellectual ventures an industrial research lab? 
So for the first question, the key difference with Ink and Switch is that we are independent. Um, and this is a perhaps not replicable, although I wonder, but the typically with a lab, it's attached to a university um, or it's attached to a corporate parent. And we had this idea that we could do that same kind of research with a theme, but starting with investor money. And we essentially made a, you know, used our, I don't know, Silicon Valley street cred to um, get some investors that were willing to make what was basically a pretty small grant. This is key with research. You need to do things on a shoestring budget. Uh, so there's a whole art to that that I can talk about, but essentially we were able to get a small grant where we said, we have formed an entity, you know, it's a legal entity and you can purchase shares in it, but we are never going to return a profit explicitly. Um, and the idea is what we will actually produce is a, call it a, you call it IP if you want to, if you want to use that terminology, but we'll produce a stack of essentially reports on here are three good places to start businesses where we sort of validated technology and market and timing and other things. And here's a stack of, you know, 10 others that we've um, sort of falsified. Time isn't, there's something interesting there, but the time isn't right or the technology doesn't work or something like that. And so the, the, the idea here is that they could pay for essentially Intel or, or the optionality of being able to use this for spin outs. And in fact, that's what we ended up um, doing. We have our first spin out, which is what I'm working on right now, which is called Muse, which is a kind of um, a, a creative tool for the iPad, a tool for thought. And it came out of a bunch of weird research ideas that I think would have been pretty impossible to make in a startup because we spent several years exploring things that were way off the map in terms of what people expect from a from a product like this. And now we're in the process of trying to turn that into something that can be commercialized. And then if that throws off some good results that this comes back to the flywheel of funding, which is the, the lab has a small piece of uh, Muse. And if it has that plus some other uh, stake in some other companies that spun out from it and potentially some, one or more of those gives a return, that money can go back into the lab to do more research. So the independent nature of it is, um, uh, is I think what, what makes it switch different. Cool. And there the was second one question. was intellectual, yeah. intellectual yeah. ventures. Consider, yeah. Would you consider them an industrial research lab? I'm quickly Googling. So as <laughs> you can Nathan see, I'm not no uh, Yeah. We can, uh, I mean, we can, we can move on. It's uh, intellectual ventures is Nathan Merfold's uh, company, which uh, I think of as more of a um, investor in patents as an asset class. Um, uh, so I think they do less, they try to get research going and maybe manage it, but I think that the research is maybe more done by other people. Um, let's just uh, move on. Um, I, I will quickly note there, there is another category of kind of labs that's maybe um, more in the vein of what you talked about, which is uh, Evan Williams has Obvious and uh, Max Levchin has one whose name is escaping me. But the idea there is, yeah, you have maybe a little bit like the Edison vibe where you have some entrepreneur who's been successful. They make this vehicle to explore some weird ideas, maybe do some investment, but the ultimate goal is to incubate a startup. Um, so I, I think that's on the same dimension, but maybe doesn't quite have the time horizon that, um, that I'm thinking of. Cool. All right, let's, uh, let's see if we can get through a few more questions. So Ryan asks for your thoughts on Dynamic Land, which was one of the projects that came out of Hark, which you mentioned earlier. And is it, men is it missing one of the ingredients of a good lab potentially, such as e.g. ongoing funding? I feel like that's a leading question, uh, but yes. Dynamic Land is Brett Victor's work on physicality in end user programming. Um, it's an incredible piece of forward thinking uh, research for sure. That said, uh, it does not have that sustainable funding model. Um, so it, I think it serves like a lot of Victor's work as a great inspiration in terms of the work itself. But I think it, from what I've seen, I don't know a ton about it, but um, from, from the outside, it seems to lack that, that flywheel a little bit. Um, so I think that's a, that flywheel is something that uh, we're all still searching for. Because to some degree, whenever you take funding, that's gonna automatically change your incentives and your priorities and trying to keep the purity of the research while also making something uh, fundable on an ongoing basis is quite a challenge. Yeah. 
and Brett Victor has managed to keep it going. I think he's scraping together donations from you know people who sort of buy into the vision. But um, and I absolutely do think that, especially for really early stuff, that some kind of social funding in the same way that you do Kickstarters for games and whatever is, is possible. Um, one example I'll, I'll name there on a small scale is Andy Matushak, also doing tools for thought work. And he has a Patreon set up and he basically is self-sustaining with that. Now he doesn't have a big team. He's working on digital things. So he doesn't need a lot of materials or whatever. Maybe that's not super scalable, but I think there are enough people who are interested and excited by this that you could run it as almost more of a, a nonprofit um, approach, at least in the early days. Yeah. And Andy is more of a one man lab, but I think these things can go through stages as well, where one person can prove out a concept. The more you prove things out, the more resources you can attract, the more resources you get, the more you can build. And the more you build, the more you can sort of demonstrate to people that you deserve more resources. So you get a flywheel, you bootstrap it and get a flywheel going. Absolutely. Um, all right. Um, question from Omar. Within a company or institution, uh, culturally, how does a leader encourage research and exploration while still making sure that the folks doing the research are hungry and curious. And how does that relate to uh, employee evaluations and incentives? I think there's two things to note on culture. And um, I had the opportunity some time back, I was interviewing uh, CEO candidates for Heroku. And we were big enough at that time that we were interviewing pretty top tier people who had run big companies. And so I got to you know, hear from a lot of pretty skilled people about how they think about running large organizations. And one thing that struck me over and over again is all of them had felt the, how do you stay innovative question was just unanswered. Um, and that they had all struggled with it in some way. And again, you look at the Jeff Bezos and Amazon example, and it's just very much based on this one person's singular cult of personality, moral authority, whatever. It's not really like a scalable, repeatable, institutionalizable thing. So that said, I will say two things, having been a, a manager in a, not a huge company, but a, a relatively big one and having struggled with the, the innovation, how do you stay, keep your innovative edge problem. Uh, one is that I do think it is a different kind of person. I think there's a, a category of person that I think likes to think the wild ideas and the, and the big thoughts and try weird stuff, and go way off the map and they get kind of, irritated or bored by what's necessary to support something that exists in the real world. And there's another kind of person who um, finds the wild thinking just kind of pointless and wants to serve real people with real needs. And you can think of those as yeah, the, the thinkers and the operations or what have you. Not to say there aren't people that don't cross those thresholds, but I think identifying which category people are in. And then the second part of it is you need to isolate the lab. And so, for example, Amazon's lab is based in San Francisco, while the rest of their company is based in uh, further north. And um, this, is, this is often the case. Uh, actually, the uh, Bell, um, sorry, Xerox Park, I think Xerox was based on the East Coast somewhere. And the person that set up the lab really insisted on being in California, both for the maverick hippie culture, uh, but also just to be physically far away so that it can have its own space for these new weird ideas to incubate. So I think that, um, you know, it depends on the size of the company a lot, but if I was right now today in charge of a technology company that had, I don't know what, 250 employees and I was worried about us uh, being innovative, I would think in terms of, can I carve off three to 5% of my budget, get a separate space with a separate group of people and separate directives and give them resources and time and direction to produce innovations that are relevant to my business. And I hope you have people crossing back and forth between it. There's a lot of downsides to the, to the isolation as well. They can become irrelevant or they can lose touch with the real problems. Um, but there's, there's a whole, whole art with that. But I, in many ways, I think it's an unsolved problem. Yeah. Um, I, I, I agree. Um, okay, question from uh, Trey. So Trey is pointing out some differences between VCs and um, the corporate uh, research model and sort of asking whether this is an advantage for VCs. So he's, he's pointing out that in the corporate uh, model, the, uh, the sort of corporate research lab is tied to a corporate parent who will only distribute or continue to fund innovations that complement the company's existing assets or distribution network. Whereas in the VC model where they're funding companies, 
you know, those startups um, innovate and find, you know, whatever buyers and, and distribution is appropriate for their innovation. Um, and, uh, and also that VCs have kind of significant capital, you know, locked up uh, in these kind of long-term, you know, 10 plus year funds um, that, that may be a similar in scale or even bigger than, than corporate research labs. So is that, you know, what, what are the implications of those differences? Is that an advantage for the VC model, do you think? I do, I do think venture capital does fit into this innovation spectrum. And you could argue, yeah, that the, or I should say the implicit argument there that with a corporate R&D lab, you have the Xerox problem, which is the parent company was well situated to commercialize laser printers because they kind of look and feel like copiers. They weren't well situated to commercialize on many of the other innovations that came out. And so with venture money, could that be kind of a, um, you know, more distributed, almost a more ARPA-like approach to just get the money to the people that need it, that are doing interesting things and have them be not tied to some corporate parent. Um, so I don't have a good sort of, let's say, logical answer to that, but I have a, an intuitive answer, which is I was moved to Silicon, I moved to San Francisco to join Y Combinator and participate in the venture world. And because I saw it as a, the best place to be to do innovation and spent seven years there. And there's a lot of things that are great about it and certain kinds of innovation is very good at, but I also saw the gap. And so I started Ink and Switch because I wanted to, I saw a gap in the kinds of innovations we can do, including time horizons and including ways these um, ways stuff gets funded and so forth that was not covered by venture. So yes, yeah, on one hand, you could say why, why Combinator is kind of a research lab, um, but I think there is a, there's a different model that's a little closer to academic, a little longer time horizons, probably less money actually, um, but also not expecting the same returns, probably get into the public goods problem a little bit here as well. Um, so I, I think VC is good. And, and in a way, I'm almost disappointed that venture, the venture world or the Silicon Valley world has not actually produced a good way to do this research stuff lab, research lab stuff. I was really excited for Hark because that seemed to be an attempt by a high profile Silicon Valley person to put their money to work in something that's more this way. And it didn't pan out for some reason that I'm not, not entirely sure of. So yeah, that's, that's my answer. VC doesn't scratch the itch that I'm going after here. Yeah, makes sense. Um, all right, maybe we can squeeze in one or two last questions here. So um, we had a follow up, uh, a follow up to the question about kind of um, you know keeping big companies innovative. When you are measuring the performance of people who are with you know a, an innovation group or a, a research lab within a company, how much do you measure the inputs? versus outputs, right? So like you can measure inputs of how much research is being done or you can measure, well, how, how many impactful inventions did you come up with? That is a tough one. Yeah, that sounds to me like um, a reframing of the leading versus trailing indicators um, yeah. stuff. So the, to, 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 re, to summarize that briefly is that trailing indicators are what matter to business. So for example, happy customers over the long term. Um, but that takes a long time to get to. And so if you wait for those to, to come, you know, if you wait three years to find out that um, a customer is happy or unhappy, uh, that, that doesn't allow you to be agile enough about changes. So then you look for leading indicators that indicate um, that you're going to earn revenue or that customers will be happier that you've solved people's problems. And I think the same thing exists for research, which is it's natural to look at the leading indicators, like how much are you publishing? Uh, because the trailing indicators for these time horizons are really tough, right? And certainly investing in venture has the same problem, which is you can't tell if a fund is good for 10 plus years because that's just how long it takes to get the returns. And I think you have a similar time horizon, if not more so here, which is the impact of all these different things we've talked about uh, in these four examples took a pretty long time to see, not in every case, um, so if you're, if you're judging based on that, probably the people that did the research <laughs> already left your lab by the time you give them their performance review. So I think, I think you need both the overall value of the lab. You do need to keep an eye on what's the actual impact here, but you absolutely cannot use that for ongoing performance evaluation. And so you do need to find those leading indicators. And I think a lot of it does depend on and you know, just sort of taste and judgment of whoever's, whoever's guiding the ship. Um, and ARPA was lucky enough to have some pretty amazing people that were in that role. Modern times, you have these these company founders that just have that that sense 
for whether something is, you know, whether it's worth staying the course. But yeah, again, unsolved management problem for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe we'll uh, squeeze in the last question. Patents. Um, patents have had a mixed track record in the history of industrial research. What is your view of the role of patents in promoting or discouraging industrial research? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not quite knowledgeable about enough about that. I certainly have a bit of a knee jerk reaction, I think, from my software engineering background, because software patents are basically a, a pretty big wreck, and I don't think add a lot of value to the economy. Um, but at the same time, yeah, when you look at the Bell Labs example, that's a that's that is a form of output. Um, if you get to something and, and you can use the patent office as a kind of gatekeeper for trying to judge a little bit whether whether something has some kind of long term economic value. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. I would say that a version of patents, there is a version of patents I can imagine that is not the patent system we have today that could actually be really great for encouraging this kind of uh, research work. But um, yeah, certainly when you're in software and, and internet, I kind of have the feeling that it's not really a useful path. All right. That's, a, that's very much a hot take, though. Not, not a well-researched yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, this has been great. We'll, uh, we'll draw a line here. Thank you so much, Adam, for joining us and spending the time with us today. Um, and Thanks if you want to just me. repeat uh, again, if people want to find out more about you uh, or your lab or the, the product you just launched, where, where should they go? Yeah, so inkandswitch.com will take you to our minimalist homepage where we link all of our various papers. If you, for some reason you have a, a desire to read 5,000 word essays about the fine points of CRDTs or tablets and styluses. Um, and then the spin out venture I'm working on now called Muse is at museapp.com. So that's an, an iPad app. And, um, and then my, my homepage is adamwiggins.com. And Great. go ahead and say hi to me on Twitter maybe. All right. And uh, if you want to find out more about progress studies for young scholars, uh, that is at progressstudies.school. And you can find my stuff at rootsofprogress.org. So, uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. And um, join us again in a couple of weeks for the next one of these. Um, and thanks uh, again, Adam. This is great. Great talk. Great conversation. Thank you. So long, everybody.